So we'll, uh, we'll start the uh, breakout session now. Um, there are seats available around the table, so don't be shy. You can really, uh, all of you uh, can sit uh, on the table. You have seats uh, available. So thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, breakout session on Mind the Gap, Seeking Public and Private Sector Collaboration for Improved Debt Transparency. We have an excellent uh, panel tonight to uh, discuss this, uh, this issue. On my uh, right, uh, Hung Tran is the uh, Executive Managing Director of the Institute of uh, International Finance. Uh, he has a, a, a long career in the uh, financial sector and the, uh, the IMF, and he's also leading at the IIF the Global Capital Markets Department, and I think uh, many of you are receiving the uh, daily or very regular excellent uh, analysis uh, on, uh, on markets that he, he and his team are preparing. Um, on my extreme uh, left, uh, Andy Boko. Andy is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Monetary Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He has uh, a long experience in the U.S. Uh, government, especially in the Treasury. Uh, I'm especially pleased to, to have Andy uh, in the panel because we used to be uh, sitting together on the other side of the street uh, at the IMF Executive Board uh, a few years, too many years ago. <laughs> so welcome, Andy. Uh, <coughs> To my extreme right uh, is uh, Andras, Andras Res, who is the uh, deputy CEO of the uh, Hungarian uh, Government Debt Management uh, Office, uh, the agency AKK. And uh, Andras uh, joined the AKK at when it was created more than 20 years ago. So he has a lot of uh, experience and uh, knowledge on uh, debt management. And uh, last but not least, uh, Lisa. So those who attended the previous uh, breakout session here already uh, uh, already know uh, Lisa. Lisa Schineller is a managing director at SNPs. Uh, she is a lead analyst in sovereign and international public finance uh, ratings for the Americas, so large American, Latin American countries in particular, the US. But she's also responsible for some uh, international uh, finance, uh, financial institutions such as the uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and IDA. So Lisa is a very well-known figure uh, within those walls uh, <laughs> due to her responsibilities and uh, SNPs. So before uh, opening the, uh, the floor to, uh, to the panelists, uh, I would like to maybe uh, set the stage about the uh, topic we, uh, we plan to discuss tonight. Uh, we, we know, all of you know by definition, that uh, transparency in debt issued by governments uh, has increased significantly in the previous decades. Uh, the uh, mere fact that we can have this forum here and meet and discuss about debt management, debt composition, debt strategy is a demonstration of this increased transparency. Um, so um, if you Google uh, public debt, for almost any country, you will end up uh, on a website uh, with some figures uh, on the uh, debt stock, the debt composition, the debt strategy. Um, it's uh, definitely something very, very common now. Um, and this transparency has had uh, positive externalities, both for issuers and for investors, but also for the capital markets at large in terms of uh, increased uh, uh, predictability uh, of the financial flows and uh, stability, even though uh, talking about financial stability uh, is, uh, is always a bit, uh, a bit dangerous. So this is a very positive trend, and we have to recognize it. But if it was only uh, the story, we shouldn't really meet for a very long time for this breakout session. But the reality is there are gaps. and. Um, there are gaps, and this uh, trend of increased transparency could be a bit misleading. 
um, and we realized um, over the past years uh, during some uh, restructuring episodes in some countries, uh, during some uh, crisis or tensions in other countries, that uh, the information on public debt is often incomplete. Uh, and sometimes there are elements uh, very important about the sustainability of the debt of a country that are not available. It could be uh, a question of uh, issuer, so we have good information uh, on the central government debt usually, but you have other public issuers such as state-owned enterprises, other public agencies, sometimes subnationals. Uh, for which, at the end of the day, the central government is responsible for. And transparency for those issuers is not as developed, uh, exhaustive today as for the central government. It's also a question of investors, of change in investors. We moved from a world when you have either bondholders with market instruments with very uh, explicit characteristics and bilateral uh, official lenders grouped uh, in the Paris Club to uh, a situation where uh, among the lenders you have official sectors that are not members of the Paris Club and you have private uh, lenders as well and they don't necessarily uh, provide as much information on the uh, debt, uh, on the holding of, uh, of debt with, uh, with government or the public sector. And last but not least, in terms of instruments, uh, it's not no longer, as I mentioned, a question of uh, concessional loans and bonds. It's also uh, private uh, contracts collateralized debt, it's also PPPs, uh, so you have also new instruments uh, for, for which uh, information and transparency are more uh, challenging. And uh, lack of transparency may have very uh, important uh, consequences for the countries and for the investors, as we have seen uh, during a few episodes of the uh, past years. So there is really uh, 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 a necessity uh, to, to try to, to address those gaps and to, um, to make sure that we can continue to improve transparency on public sector debt uh, beyond uh, what has been already achieved. This is really what we, uh, we plan to discuss uh, during this, uh, this session. So we, uh, we will listen uh, to uh, our panelists about ways and initiatives to, to increase transparency. But we, we also would really like uh, to, to, to listen to your views uh, uh, around the table. We, we have a, a very uh, important group uh, around this table. So it's really important also for you to express your views, uh, concerns, uh, criticisms on what can be done uh, and how we, we need to do it. So let me now turn to uh, Hong for uh, the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian, and uh, organizer of this meeting uh, for inviting us. Um, we have my colleagues, uh, Sonia Gibbs and Jade, uh, sitting around the table as well, and we are happy to interact with you uh, to discuss uh, this topic. Um, as Sebastian said, in the past 15 years, many developments uh, have really rendered the sovereign debt market more complex. Um, why many countries are subscribing to the IMF, SDDS, in terms of dissemination of information and data, uh, improving the overall flow of information, um, and in the bond market in particular has become more transparent because to issue a bond you need to issue a prospectus describing what you use to proceed for and so on. Uh, all the developments have made the uh, sovereign debt market, particularly for developing countries, uh, suffering from gaps of uh, transparency. New players are not only banks lending, but also non-bank entities, particularly commodity traders like Landcore, engaging on own kind of collateralized lending or advancing money against delivery of commodities at some point in the future. Uh, Non-Paris Club bilateral official lenders is another category. And last but not least, new instruments, uh, which may not look like bonds or loans, but basically has the same economic impact as a uh, debt obligation for the borrowing countries. Uh, because of that, uh, in the past few years, we do experience uh, several episodes of uh, hidden debt being um, uh, disclosed, uh, certainly causing distress to both the borrowing countries and the international investor community as well. Uh, so to address uh, this kind of um, concern, particularly in the context of the rise in the overall net level 
of the former uh, HIPIC countries, the low-income countries that we, we discussed in the previous uh, breakout session. Uh, we at the IF, the Institute of International Finance, uh, over the past uh, six to nine months received uh, a lot of requests from both public and private sector uh, entities from the IMF, uh, from the World Bank, G20, Paris Club, and national government including US uh, Treasury, UK Treasury, uh, European Commission, uh, also several private sector entities and uh, civil society organization. They came to us and request us to see if we can spearhead an effort to promote uh, disclosure in terms of sovereign lending and borrowing to improve transparency. And the background why they came to us is that uh, the IAF, in case uh, some of you may not be aware of it, we are a private uh, sector association of global financial services firms. We have close to 500 members in, in 75 countries. Uh, and among other things we did in 2004, we collaborated with government from borrowing country, issuing country, and private sector uh, financial institutions to uh, draft and to promote the principle for stable capital flow and fair debt restriction, which was endorsed by the G20 in 2004. So with that um, background, we got the, the request from many entities uh, to, to uh, launch uh, that transparency initiative which we did uh, after our own board of directors authorized it in June. The working group, uh, that trans transparency working group now has about 35 members among the IAF membership and we really have engaged in collaborating with the public sector mainly through the G20 International Financial Architecture Working Group, several meetings with them, with the Paris Club and national governments as well as uh, civil society organizations such as the the debt jubilee in US and UK. The idea is to develop a voluntary principle for debt uh, transparency, uh, meaning to apply to own countries because own countries can benefit from, from more transparency. Uh, but for practical reasons and in recognition of the fact that there are different degree of transparency in different segment of the markets and in different regions, we suggest that at the beginning we focus more on the PRGT, uh, the poverty reduction growth, trust the uh, countries, uh, 63 countries, mainly low income country uh, to begin with and then we expand to the whole universe afterward. The idea is to really uh, encourage voluntary disclosure of uh, terms of uh, loan and other credit like uh, transaction between the lenders, both public and private sector lenders, and the borrowing, borrowing countries, both central government, sub-sovereign uh, entities, and state-owned uh, enterprises, uh, basically from both sides of the equation. And the idea is to really enhance disclosure, enhance timely information, and, uh, and, and transparency. Uh, for antitrust purposes, the voluntary uh, principles are drafted as a voluntary exercise the um, disclosure of the terms of the transaction, uh, for example, the amount, uh, the maturity, but the price, the interest rate has to be expressed as part of the uh, predetermined buckets and not uh, precise numbers and with a 90-day seasoning period so that it is not uh, competitive information sharing among different uh, private sector entities, but of historical value for, for market participants. The idea is that with more information, more transparency, both lenders and borrowers can benefit. Borrowers can benefit because it will strengthen the role of um, the country, the population, civil society, parliament in monitoring and assessing the borrowing activity of the government for the lenders because they have more accurate and timely information to access the credit worthiness and the debt sustainability of the borrowing countries. Uh, so in the interaction with different uh, counterparts, particularly with the G20, one issue that they really put on the table is to encourage us to uh, include beyond and in addition to debt transparency, the issue of debt sustainability in the sense that particularly for the low income country, they want private sector lenders, the banks and non-bank lenders, to acknowledge the importance of debt sustainability, particularly the analysis of the fund and the bank, particularly for country uh, having concessional, concessional financing from those institutions, to the extent that if the, uh, the, uh, the fund and the bank 
uh, assess the country to be uh, at the limit or above the limit of their sustainability, then, then private sector lenders should not lend. Um, we have been in discussion with, uh, with our counterpart in the G20. Uh, of course, in the private sector, we do understand and recognize the importance of that sustainability and uh, support the promotion of, of, of sustainability. However, uh, we made clear to our counterparts that there are some red lines that we cannot cross. One, we cannot acknowledge and say that private sector banks are responsible for the debt sustainability of a sovereign country, which is simply beyond the capacity of a private, private entity. Um, and doing so would also open the banks to potential new liabilities, which inadvertently may uh, reduce the flow of financing to, to borrowing countries. And secondly, we cannot uh, abrogate or outsource the decision on, on a loan by a bank to an outside entity, even uh, the World Bank or the IMF. Um, our G20 counterparts understand those uh, red lines, and at the moment we are in the process of discussing the actual wording of, of the draft principle so that both sides can be happy with it. But the basic thing is, is that um, beyond technical issues like the terms of the transaction to be disclosed, how it should be disclosed, and how it will be collected and disseminated. And here, hopefully, we expect either the fund of the bank would step up and agree to be the receptacle of this disclosure and com uh, compile them in a way and a database that will be useful for everyone. The key issue that we are confronted now is really consultation with you as borrowing countries. Uh, because essentially um, nothing can be done, nothing can be disclosure if the confidentiality clause in the loan document uh, cannot be waived or changed. Because if it is stayed the way it is now, then nobody can disclose anything <laughs> because of confidentiality requirement. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, for the, 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 the initiative to go forward and for the impact, to be positive in terms of helping everyone, particularly borrowing countries, to receive stable flow of uh, capital to, to develop and to, to modernize their economies. I think you in borrowing countries will be the, the, the key counterparts that we would like to interact with, consult, and listen to your view and input. So that is the, the background of this session that we are grateful to, to the World Bank to, to allow us to present this to you. Uh, the idea is, is uh, condense in the questionnaire that you find in front of you at your seat. Um, there are a series of questions regarding to the principle of it, uh, who should be covered, uh, how it should be done, uh, what kind of uh, terms and, and conditions of the transaction should be disclosed, uh, how frequently, and, and so on and so forth. And we really are grateful if you can take time to uh, fill it in and return to us uh, via Sebastian and his colleagues, and then they will uh, send it to us. You can um, cite it or not cite it. You can keep it anonymous or not, or you can identify your country as um, middle-income country, low-income country, or high-income country to give us an idea of, of uh, your perspective. And, um, and going forward, we also would like to have a closer um, direct dialogue with you. And again, with the help of Sebastian and, and colleagues, we will approach you uh, later on. So basically, that's the, the initiative that we, um, we are developing at the moment. The idea is that um, having consulting with you and get your input, and depending on the reaction from you, we will finalize the wording the, of the draft, uh, get um, uh, review and comment from the G20, from the Paris Club, from different uh, stakeholders, from civil society organization, so that by the June summit of the G20 under Japanese presidency next June in Tokyo. Hopefully by then we can uh, submit to the G20 uh, draft uh, voluntary principle on debt, uh, debt transparency and seek their endorsement and after that we will hope to launch it and have it implemented. So I stop here and happy to uh, answer your questions later on. Thank you very much, uh, Hong. So uh, a very uh, promising initiative. Um, in terms of the questionnaires, uh, so you can, uh, once it's uh, filled, uh, you can really give the questionnaire to me, to Andrew, uh, who is uh, supporting us. 
or to any World Bank uh, staff who is uh, working on the uh, uh, for the uh, SDMF. Uh, if you want to uh, to follow up uh, and express your views more directly with the IAF, I think you can uh, ask uh, uh, to talk to uh, Hung or one of uh, Sonia. his colleagues, yeah. Sonia. Um, so now let me uh, turn to uh, Andy for the uh, point of view, the perspective of the U.S. Uh, Treasury. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Good to see you again. And uh, good to be here, uh, everybody. Uh, we at the uh, Department of Treasury have been monitoring uh, debt issues along with our colleagues from the international financial institutions and uh, in the Paris Club. Uh, and particularly the, the growing risks to debt sustainability that we see, especially among lower income and middle income countries. Uh, such risks uh, have risen substantially uh, and growing debt burdens are heightening concerns about fiscal sustainability and the diversion of scarce budget resources to servicing debt. The share of countries at high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress, as assessed by the bank and the fund, has roughly doubled since uh, 2013 to about 40 percent. I know many of you are very familiar with these uh, numbers. The risk to the global economy of ignoring the growing risks to debt sustainability going forward are twofold. First, sustaining debt service could become infeasible for economies due to rollover risks or interest rate risks. And second, delays uh, to appropriately managing debt burdens could lead to another period of slow investment or growth due to debt overhangs. Installed growth, of course, will not benefit anybody. In our view, uh, the international financial institutions, borrowing countries, uh, and both sovereign and private creditors all have roles to play in enhancing debt sustainability in low-income countries in particular. The solutions may be a bit idiosyncratic for each country and require thoughtful consideration by all of us in the international community, but a critical element of addressing debt sustainability will be to increase transparency further across a broader range of debt obligations. The INF, IIF's initiative on transparency, in our view, would help fill an important need within what should be a mutually reinforcing structure to support sustainable debt practices. Collecting and disseminating the relevant data will provide a key means to promote good policy development and credit decisions. And while responsible creditors already employ best practices, developing a set of explicit principles like the IAFs will help other creditors, uh, will help promote other creditors uh, to conform to these better practices. Uh, creating a mechanism for disclosure also shifts the dynamic from a presumption of non-disclosure and opacity to a bias towards transparency. And in the context of increased reliance on emerging creditors and private sector borrowing, each step toward sharing information works to reduce the chances of market moving surprises and a buildup of debt sustainability risks. Hung also laid out other uh, benefits of the IAF initiative and, and we fully concur with his, his analysis. Uh, now to take a little bit of a step back, uh, and many of, many of you know uh, these issues well over the years, but uh, just to repeat, uh, from the U.S. Treasury perspective, um, you know, we've seen a lot of this before. In the 1990s and the 2000s, the international financial institutions and traditional bilateral creditors participated in a series of generous debt concessions towards the poorest countries, ultimately culminating in roughly 100% reduction of bilateral and IFI debts under the HIPAA initiative and the MIDRI initiative, Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative. Treasury was actually actively involved in building consensus on these initiatives with uh, a, a variety of partners and it effectively eliminated the debt of 36 low-income countries. Uh, it was of course the right thing to do but uh, the cost of removing that debt overhang from uh, HIPAA countries fell on uh, taxpayers in, in advanced economies. We're very eager to prevent another debt buildup, and we in the United States have tried to align our assistance tools uh, based on these lessons that we've learned. So in the United States, we've largely transitioned from lending to the poorest countries to providing grants to the poorest countries. 
We also, also strongly supported the introduction of a framework for assessing countries' debt sustainability and guidelines to limit unsustainable borrowing to prevent a recurring of a lend and forgive cycle uh, from uh, traditional creditors. Uh, the IMF and World Bank's debt sustainability frameworks for low-income countries and market access countries also fill valuable roles in creating a common public analysis of the risks to a country's ability to meet debt obligations. These debt sustainability analyses are a critical input into the broader assessment of the macroeconomic performance of an economy, and our hope is that they also provide useful insights to policymakers as they evaluate how to meet uh, various domestic spending priorities. In retrospect, however, uh, our various efforts uh, to provide debt relief uh, and set up a new framework has failed to anticipate how easily our efforts would be countered by a new wave of creditors that do not have sufficient transparency on their, on their lending and do not fully follow uh, these debt sustainability frameworks. The rise of other official bilateral, plurilateral, and private creditor lending, especially to countries at high risk of debt distress, is complicating debt resolution processes necessary to reestablish debt sustainability. And excessive use of innovative but sometimes inappropriate mechanisms like collateralization may also delay debt resolutions. Another aspect of the broader context is that we have been in an extended period of relatively low interest rates ever since the global financial crisis. This has ser served as a time to reduce borrowing costs and make growth enhancing investments. But time will tell whether uh, how productive the budgets of countries have been in using these, uh, this time of, of low interest rates. Early signals give us cause for concern. Uh, debt statistics compiled by the bank show that between 2000 and 2016, uh, public and publicly guaranteed debt of low income countries increased by about 50% in terms of stock and their debt service has more than doubled during the same period. Uh, the trend is even more striking uh, when you take into a account uh, private sector credit. Of course, if the debt is used for growth enhancing investment, then repayment capacity should be increasing. Uh, growth can cut debt to GDP ratios by increasing the denominator, obviously. However, as IMF staff has, have highlighted in recent years, uh, expanding investment appears to account for only a, about uh, one-third of the uh, increase in debt. Um, let me repeat that. So higher debt in recent years, about one-third of it is clearly devoted to uh, higher investment. Uh, the rest is either less clear or devoted to consumption. Another trend that bears uh, scrutiny is the increased use of collateralized debt often issued by state-owned enterprises and natural resource-based collateralized debt can offer a useful credit enhancement. However, collateralized debt can also tighten revenue streams and threaten sovereign ownership of lucrative assets. Uh, at the moment, there is little evidence that collateralization will lower the overall cost of borrowing, facilitate, facilitate sustainable fiscal management, or enable favorable development outcomes. And the lack of transparency around collateralized loans also obscures the overall risk of public debt and in cases of default can complicate the assessment of creditor hierarchy. Uh, so let me talk briefly about next steps and the role that all of us uh, can play. We see action for a number of actors uh, to reinforce the importance of prudent lending and borrowing. For official creditors, uh, we see several steps. Creditor countries including emerging creditors, uh, need to pursue best practices in their uh, lending. Key safeguards like environmental impact studies, appropriate procurement processes, labor standards sh should all be taken into account. Uh, projects should also be consistent with underlying economics and debt sustainability. And there are cons some concerning signs on, on this area. At present, for example, countries at risk of debt distress uh, over a third of them are, are currently scheduled to take on sub significantly more new debt from emerging uh, creditors, uh, particularly China. Second, we are also wor working uh, in the official sector to avert a wave of messy debt resolutions by improving the quality and availability of debt data and increasing the incentives for sustainable debt management and inviting new creditors into tested resolution frameworks. 
For example, we are urging official creditors in the G20 to hold ourselves to the G20 operational guidelines for sustainable financing, which were approved last year. These guide guidelines include elements on information sharing and transparency, reaffirm a commitment to debt sustainability, and recognize the benefits of mechan mechanisms to minimize litigation issues, such as the enhanced collection collective action clauses. One of the ways to avoid debt resolutions to begin with is to enhance transparency of official debt. Creditors could do more here, such as publishing more data related to a broader range of lending to cover lending to state-owned enterprises, contingent loans, collateralized loans. All these have been mentioned by, uh, by our chair and, and by Hunk Tron. Uh, also in the official sector, we are uh, looking to uh, strengthen the uh, role of the Paris Club. We are hopeful that China and other emerging creditors will see that full membership in the club, along with the embrace of its principles, is in their own interest and that participation facilitates orderly debt resolution. Borrowing countries also have a critical role to play. The opacity of, the opacity of some developing countries' public debt management makes it difficult for private markers, markets to properly price sovereign credit. Developing countries also need to mobilize domestic resources while not stifling the private sector by overburdening a narrow tax base. Debt management functions should be elevated as a core competency of the government and appropriately integrate, integrated into the project planning and budgeting process. And public disclosure of a broader range of debt and debt-like instruments would add clarity for better policy development while mitigating the risk of debt surprises that can disrupt disrupt access to finance. Hong Chong also mentioned that borrowing countries will be essential to the success of the IF initiative given the confidentiality requirements. Uh, private sector creditors can also play an important role in sharing key data on sovereign deals, entering into contracts cognizant of debt sustainability issues, and participating in workouts if borrowers are unable to repay. The IIF initiative would make some important enhancements towards transparency by covering a broader set of arrangements than are currently disclosed, unifying major creditors around a common set of elements, and potentially creating a mechanism to more easily monitor exposure. Finally, the uh, international financial institutions are also playing important roles in addressing this issue. We strongly support the work of the IMF and the World Bank in their multi-pronged agenda to enhance debt transparency and sustainability. To implement the measures identified, the bank and the fund should continue to take con concrete steps to obtain more comprehensive debt data from member countries with the goal of public disclosure of debt data. They should more clearly flag data deficiencies in debt sustainability analyses and promote debt sustainability through strengthened use of debt limits and non-concessional borrowing policies. We also believe that additional resources, both bilaterally and through the IMF and World Bank, will need to be dedicated to provide capacity building support to low-income members to help them address issues related to debt management and data disclosure. Let me end there uh, and uh, look forward to uh, the subsequent panelists and our question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for the uh, presentation, explanation, and the detailed roadmap uh, <laughs> for, for the future. So, Andras, now if you could present the uh, Hungarian case and lessons, please. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone attending the, the panel. Uh, uh <coughs> Uh, Hungary is a, a small country, uh, and actually we, we basically build up our uh, government securities market or uh, uh, securities market from the 1990s, and uh, uh, after a transformation from the previous uh, socialist uh, uh, system. That means that uh, we basically had to start from scratches, and. Uh, that's why that was a continuous uh, development, uh, how we reach the present situation. It is always very important from the point of view of uh, debt sustainability and uh, debt public debt data that Hungary is a member of the European Union, which means that we not only have to uh, uh, 
uh, act according to, to uh, the Hungarian reg uh, regulation, but also EU regulation as well, which is uh, quite uh, important from, uh, from the uh, topic of this uh, session. Uh, is it work? Uh, but is also very important beside our uh, EU membership that the present government is quite uh, 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 willing to reduce public debt. Hungary always have a relatively high public debt uh, ratio. Uh, we started from 70% in the early 1990s, which <coughs> went up almost to 90%. And as you can see from this graph, uh, we had a period when our 50% public debt uh, ratio went up to more than 90% and that was that point when our present government uh, made a new constitution which actually included a uh, domestic debt rule which means that we have to target a debt below 50% of GDP. The EU regulation calls for another debt ceiling that is 60% of GDP and both regulations require that we have to reach that uh, below that level uh, uh, during a, a limited time period. That means that uh, of course you can only reach these targets if you have uh, proper data about public debt, so that was also a very important prerequisite if we wanted to uh, satisfy this requirement. Of course, it is also very important that according to the Hungarian regulation, we have the necessary authorities to supervise these projects, whether we are uh, in conformity with the uh, uh, legal requirement, that is the State Audit Office and uh, uh, we have a new Fiscal Council of Hungary which always have very important authority to supervise and actually if needed to make uh, s not only suggestions but, but uh, uh, decisions about how the government have to uh, reach the uh, targeted debt path. Uh, of course, uh, the easiest thing is to uh, collect information and uh, public debt data about the central government. And uh, that was in the very early period, during the uh, early 1990s, when uh, the government debt management agency was set up. And basically, uh, almost all uh, borrowing authority of the central government was transferred to this uh, debt management agency. Uh, originally, we had other actor, actors uh, who could borrow on the name of the central government, but that was, uh, that became uh, uh, quite clear early that that was not a, a, a useful or, or, or uh, efficient way to do. So uh, that, be, uh, that became the government debt management agency who uh, had the authority to borrow from the side of the central government. Uh, local authorities are a mar much more difficult uh, issue. Uh, the local authority system in Hungary is not too widespread. Uh, that's a small country, so for example, we uh, no, do not have regions uh, and all, only uh, cities uh, and, and uh, villages and uh, counties could borrow. But actually, we had a, a debt problem with, with uh, local authorities in the early uh, 2010s. And after the government decided to uh, make a, a debt relief of those local authorities, there was also a decision that, yes, uh, they get rid got rid of the debt, which they couldn't uh, pay back. But at the very same time, uh, 
those authorities which they ex had before that they were free to uh, uh, borrow on the both the money market uh, the capital market and also from banks was no uh, was no longer uh, in place and that means that at present local authorities can only borrow if the, the those borrowing are approved by the government and that is a very rare phenomenon now in Hungary. So that was the result that they overborrowed for a period of time. Uh, the biggest problem is should those are state-owned or directed entities. And uh, these entities are basically uh, managed in a way by our, from, uh, from our EU membership because that is usually Eurostat who make a new uh, public entity uh, 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 make a new public entity to be included in our public sector. So that means that basically uh, recently we have, uh, for example, Exim Bank and also the state, uh, the deposit insurance fund, which was not actively run by the government, but they were also included in the public sector by Eurostat. And that means that that will also refer to the Hungarian regulation as well, so that means that uh, we calculate with those entities uh, as public entities after that. Uh, during the uh, last decades when ACAC and the debt agency received more and more authorities in man managing uh, public debt management, uh, that also included that we are usually involved in those transactions which are not uh, directly related to uh, central uh, government debt, but also to some uh, state-owned enterprises as well. For example, if the state railways uh, have a new loan, we are usually uh, required by the government to take part in, in that uh, transaction uh, as an as a advisor. Uh, concerning the publication of debt data, we have a three-tier publication of data. The first, the most important, I believe, that the debt agency, and uh, that is that agency which is uh, more cautious and, and much more keen to to. Uh, accumulate and, and uh, uh, publish data. Unfortunately, that only refer to central government debt, since that is managed by AKK. That's where we receive information about. However, it is, this is the more detailed data uh, available on the, on the market. We provide that on a monthly basis with a very minimum time lag. So that is what can be used for, for market participants or analysts to, to uh, uh, make calculation on, on economic research. The second tier, that's the National Bank of Hungary and also Eurostat, uh, who together cal uh, collect and publish information about the total public debt, the general government debt, which includes, of course, the debt of the state-owned enterprises and uh, local authorities as well. That information is in, uh, available only quarterly with a much longer timeline that, than that of the data of, of, of the debt agency. The third one that about, uh, also includes information about guarantees and also that is that entities who provide debt projections for the future and these entities are the Ministry of Finance, the State Audit Office and the Fiscal Council as well. Uh, uh, as it was uh, requested, uh, all information available also for, for loans, and uh, that is AKK who uh, actually provide those data on its website. Uh, actually, that was a uh, request for information from, the, from, from uh, an institution, and then AKK, instead of providing that information on a case-by-case -case basis, we decided to simply put that to, to our website, and now that's a regu regular publication on a quarterly basis. So that provides basically all information about loans, and uh, we, we cannot, we have to, don't have to bother with, with new requests on that topic. So I believe that 
that's in some way the, the simplest way. Uh, what Akaka use as the most important source of providing information, that's our website. Uh, and uh, we made a constant modification and upgrade of this uh, website. We uh, have our publication also on this website. And what is very important, I believe, that at the very beginning there was a decision that we uh, do a bilingual uh, website, which means that basically all information which is in Hungarian, you can find that in English as well. So uh, unfortunately, that's not the case for, with other websites, uh, but we uh, look very frequently when we uh, wants to make a calculation. Uh, I believe uh, from the point of view of uh, debt sustainability and uh, public debt data, uh, what can be uh, an important step that, that uh, an establishment of a debt agency, because uh, from our experiences I can say that the very first thing what we did was we started to collect debt data. We tried to find what kind of debt the central government have. And first, we started with the uh, uh, debt in, in uh, securities, government securities. And later on, that was a very difficult uh, task to get information about loans. But basically, that we believe that was a mission of ACACA, <coughs> that we have to have uh, that information uh, as complete as, as possible. I have to tell you that uh, when ACACA was established in 1995, uh, we took over an office which had only paper in boxes, but no staff at all, no people, not, no one. So, and uh, we were told that yes, you can find information in those boxes. And after that, when we wanted to gather information about loan contracts, we also had to ha go to the National Bank of Hungary, and there were also boxes there. So uh, I believe that for, for other people, that would no, not be encouraging. But since that was our mission to, to collect information and to put to those information to our website, I believe that that was rather effective. And uh, that's the... Uh, uh, institutional framework of, of uh, our debt agency. Uh, there are two entities which are actually responsible for investor relation. One of them, the planning department and planning and data dissemination department. So uh, the name calls for itself, and also the the front office is responsible for any request from the market about actual deals or or information. And thank you very much for your. Attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andras. Very interesting uh, story, and I think the uh, the way uh, you moved from those uh, paper contracts in boxes to uh, the current website and information is very encouraging for uh, all of us <laughs> around the table. So, uh, Lisa, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have a couple of slides. Okay, great. Um, thank you. <coughs> I think one of the um, kind of just as a broad brush comment, I wanted to highlight how um, we at S and P we think. Uh, Transparency in general, undated transparency, be it not just for debt, but in general, is, is a very important part and feeds into various aspects of our rating methodology. Where, um, so we have a framework, it's not a formal model, et cetera, for how we look at sovereign um, credit worthiness. And the, the five key areas really haven't changed um, for, you know, on aspects of it have changed, but the core of the, 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 the body of it has not in the sense of we look at the institutional setting, um, we look at the economic, the strength, resiliency of the economy, we look at the external profile, the fiscal, and this is where we get into all the debt nuances, and the monetary um, uh, policy framework, et cetera. And when we, one of the pieces of the institutional 
assessment that we look at. Uh, it's more primarily driven by, as we would say, policy execution for uh, generating positive growth dynamics, uh, sustainable, you know, um, uh, debt dynamics over time. So it's that kind of um, kind of uh, driving, you kind of uh, first blush, and then we kind of look at it in gradations. Um, but a key part of that is also uh, free flow of information, transparency and predictability in decision making, and data transparency. So that's when we're looking at the institutional setting, we also consider um, and we kind of, uh, we bring into bear in this assessment, for example, um, aspects of transparency of data in general besides policy making. And so, um, you know, we, uh, as an example, we lowered Brazil's rating earlier this year because we felt w our view of forward looking with uh, a sense that a track record of tackling some difficult fiscal structural uh, legislation is, is um, going to be slower than we had expected. While we also note at the same time aspects of our institutional assessment are, are stronger in the sense of we, we specifically note the availability of information on across you know sectors of the economy in the debt statistics etc and I'll, and I'll come back to that so there are nuances there in our institutional assessment even though we lowered it because of a primary issue kind of more s slow policy initiative and momentum in our view that we've seen and likely to move forward um, and you know, one of the things we highlight in Ecuador's rating, which is um, Brazil is double B minus, Ecuador is B minus, is you know lapses of uh, transparency, et cetera, and checks and balances uh, historically uh, a weaker setting. And I'm going to come to Ecuador as another example when I when I talk to some uh, give some more specifics on on the debt side. Um, in our rating on China, much higher rating, so uh, A+. plus. Again, we, we highlight less free flow of information and availability as we talk about that rating. So that also informs that analysis. Um, the other area was going to the economic assessment. We specifically have the ability to, because we have our start with our base view on the economy, but if we feel there are gaps uh, and that's driven by levels of per capita GDP and growth rates. But if we think there are s significant gaps in national income accounting and inconsistencies, we can adjust in a negative way that piece of, of the puzzle. And similarly on the external side, um, if we feel if we're looking at the balance of payments flows and the IIP position, if there are material inconsistencies, this is another way we can say, no, you know, while we have this data, we can, you know, do a qualitative, a negative qualitative adjustment on that in terms of that piece of the story because we don't think that you, know, you have significantly high errors and emissions, et cetera. This, we're missing something in the story. So we bring in transparency in various parts of other, our formal framework. And so now I'm going to move into the fiscal assessment where that kind of touches a little bit more uh, directly where we consider formal debt stocks. But we also have a key component that's driven by contingent liabilities. So we, as we, I talked about a bit in the, in the prior um, panel, uh, you know, we might, our, our debt, one of the subcomponents in there looking at the debt burden, we're looking at general, net general government debt to GDP and the interest burden, interest uh, payments as a share of general government revenues. But then we look, we don't just look at stated data. So one, we look at general government. So that might meet, so that's the federal, plus then bringing in state and local government, social security, would have you, other relevant key sectors. And that's internationally, across of our, our spectrum of 130 plus ratings. So that means our data, we may be constructing data in a different way from the, uh, the, the official authorities if, you know, maybe you know, our, our definition will be, will be, could be different or, or similar, depending, right? Um, I'm going to talk through a couple of cases here, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, China. Um, and I think it's important to highlight they span the rating scale, right? So that's where we're looking at, at 
at the range from a triple A down to default. Uh, and we, we've talked about, um, you know, kind of uh, some of the, 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 the lack of transparency of data. I don't have Venezuela up there. We have Venezuela in default, but obviously many of the points put on the table feed into the Venezuela d d discussion. But Ecuador, B minus. Um, so earlier this year, there was a, uh, a, under President Moreno, a report put together, a study done over a period of months, um, led by the Controller General, kind of auditing the, the debt, so to speak. Um, and here, um, you, we, the, the government brought in outside experts, some 11 of them, as, as well as you know, members of government, to take a look at, at the debt, the, the published debt statistics. Um, and if you, um, and, and there were certainly, there were many gaps, right? And this was d d discussed in, in the private sector. And we were adjusting our data as well over time. So I give the example that, um, you know, in recent years, uh, the, there was increased recourse to borrowing from the central bank. Okay, and in some statistics, that wasn't in co that the that and debt that was purchased by the Social Security Institute, the in about I think it was 2015 or so, the the or 2014 there thereabouts, um, the government specifically shifted its definition of debt <coughs> to what's called, con they viewed it as a consolidated definition of debt. So you would take out these particular pieces of intergovernment debt when you're looking at the debt stocks so they comply with their 40% to debt to GB GDP ratio. So that's it, on paper. Or, um, and I think that's the example of even if you have um, practices in place of debt limits, it's also a matter of how you maneuver or not around them, okay? So the Debt Commission, you know, kind of highlighted that, um, no, the, the debt audit, that debt is indeed greater than this 40% um, legal limit. Uh, and so it, it started in, in, with a report that came out in May, started reporting, kind of laid out as other private members, uh, private participants, uh, within Ecuador, who the market participants speak with all the time, kind of creating parallel sets of data, they came out and validated um, some of that. So, you kind of, as an example, you know, if you looked at Ecuador's gross debt, so its trajectory, gross, I'm shifting away from our metric, just is not meaningfully different um, in terms of gross and net. From, it went from 28% of GDP in 2014 to 41 in 2016. By the old government definition, it would have been 33% versus 48% in 2017. So you can see this shift in terms of if we brought in, and these are our data, so bringing in one intergovernment holdings um, of, these, of this type. And why we would bring those in is because we make the argument, we at S&P, that the market didn't, the, the government didn't have access to the markets. In a prior panel discussion, they were tapping the external markets, um, but they couldn't tap local markets, but they couldn't get all they needed from external creditors, including bilateral. So they were, they were um, there was recourse within Ecuador to these other instruments that were then growing in size. For whatever reason, in addition, the government excludes short-term debt, CETES, from their calculation of debt. So that now that with this debt report formally included, uh, includes that as well. In addition, um, uh, or it, they kind of in this report broke out what is formal debt, what are other liabilities, okay, and they put in there some oil presale contracts, for example, and other and some other loans, um, I believe, to the IMF. And then they have contingent liabilities, which is yet another section um, of their their definition. And, and they're providing these tables. But all in, the the debt metrics, they, com they acknowledged they're higher than their limit, and then that triggers some policy adjustments according to their own laws that they, they need to uh, address over time. So I think here you can see the importance of kind of gaps and looking through the different pieces of, of the debt. And this is just for the central government, m broadly speaking. We're not, not even talking about, there's a, there's, there is also some debt for Petro, Amazonas, et cetera, state-owned enterprises. But in the case of Ecuador, it, it's central government debt. It's not the SOEs or subnationals that were driving this big difference. It's 
changes in accounting and mis um, you know a lack of transparency for some central government debt. On the, the flip side, um, and so now you have the, the you know much more data disclosure and and they're tack you know kind of tackling how you will adjust for Peru triple B plus and I would say similarly for um, Chile for Colombia for example in their multi-annual plans they lay out a whole variety of things uh, of of other obligations uh, particularly for like PPPs for example um, and the this annual debt report in addition with their multi-year plan in in Peru you know you have very you know you kind of the the richness of data that you describe for Hungary in terms for uh, Peru itself, the sovereign, um, you know, different instruments, local market, external, non-resident holdings in the local market, but also there a use of PPPs is is documented. Um, they show it on a net present value basis. They show also some you know kind of uh, give some indicators as well for. Um, um, you know, kind of n excluding the revenue stream that they're expecting from from some of the assets. Um, but I think this is one of the in these instances, example of better practices. You know, and we highlight that. And within our rating, in our, in our debt assessment, in the fiscal debt assessment, we kind of put in buckets. You know, how important are these as a contingent liability or not? We we may not have sufficient order of magnitude on some aspects which we know, but we, we lay this out and it, 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 it's not material in terms of changing as a qualitative assessment for the case of Peru. Uh, the, the contingent liability assessment doesn't weigh in on the overall debt assessment, but the access to the data really clarifies, you know, the, the order of magnitude in general and, and how, you know, the, the order of importance. And so this would be a more of an example, I would say, of, of, of um, the 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 ease with which you know we can look at and tackle um, the issues it's 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 more transparent there and it has been over over a number of years. Brazil double E minus so lower rating, but um, there um, you know I would say the the debt management team that we've seen over the years um, you know you have uh, and I alluded to this before timely data on a monthly basis for the federal government. Um, it's published both by, this, by the Treasury, by the central bank, and there's some nuances in the difference. Um, but you, have, you, you work through a lot of detail in this, and, and one has different definitions of debt. So you can also see what uh, within the um, general government or, even, or central government debt stock, you know, the, the portion that's associated with repos uh, on from being uh, undertaken by the central bank. You see the portion of bonds that are held on the central bank's own balance sheet that some uh, people include, some people, you know, some in, uh, uh, some calculations include, others would not. Um, you can see when the topic of uh, under the the Rousseff administration, the recourse to um, you know using the federal uh, state owned federally owned banks to inject uh, in essence you know support for the economy via higher rates of lending financed below the line, so not captured in the published you know uh, debt um, deficit figures uh, financing from Treasury to Bend ASA, for example, you can parse that out. You can see that number. So that's where there's a, there's a you can see a richness of there of, of the data there. Much like as you highlight on Hungary, you have, there's an annual borrowing plan, and you have monthly reports that highlight you know how what is the composition of the debt and how it's tracking on a monthly basis with the annual borrowing plan um, and, and targets. I would say so. Those are important strengths. Um, you can you, the the array of data, and I would highlight that vis-a-vis -vis other certainly double B minus credits and, and other credits in general. Um, where I would say other more ch weaknesses on balance, we see kind of the pressures at local governments in in. Um, Brazil have, have, have ticked up, notwithstanding fiscal responsibility legislation and limits on personnel growth, et cetera, and the fact that Treasury does also have to approve uh, the, the, the undertaking of any credit operation by um, a, a, a local government and has to, has to know and, get and approve, the, the uh, Congress has to approve if you're borrowing from an MLI, et cetera. But there has been slippages there, and I think that's where in more recent years you've seen the uh, Treasury 
taking on better uh, dissemination of, of, in, of information so we, we know what's happening um, specifically with local governments. Uh, and I give the example there is a, um, a, uh, a, a report on the guarantees that have been issued and it comes out I forget if it's quarterly, and I, 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 I know that the, there are people in the room who, who know the, whether it's, I believe it's quarterly, um, who've, who've worked on this. But you have, you can now see which states or local or cities have, where Treasury has had to execute and, and make good on a guarantee. And, and as an example, we also rate local governments in Brazil. And that has been a key source of information for the colleagues on my team. Since if you don't have as fluid a dialogue with the local government, well, we can also pick it up by looking at, at Treasury's report that, you know, why did this state need to rely on Treasury to make good on a guarantee with, be it an MLI or, or another, or, or a local bank, be it a Bendez or a Caixa Economic, et cetera. Um, the, so we've had, there's progress there. Um, and I would say when it comes to state-owned enterprises, that is where there was a shift, and I forget exactly which year, um, but we noted it in, in the sense that under the, Lou, the, the second Lula administration, Petrobras was taken out of, of the definition of, uh, from including from, from the central bank statistics on non-financial um, public sector debt. And um, one, so you don't have th th this state-owned enterprise as part of the formal debt stocks. Um, we can get at it because, as obviously, it, it, there's well known, it, it has its published financials. But this is pieces that we'll then put together um, in 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 our analysis. Uh, you know, is the, is it a contingent liability or not, depending on in, in certain instances. So this is kind of the work that we look at, um, uh, the data that we look at. Finally, on China, obviously a key topic in terms of uh, transparency. A plus rating, much higher rating, but these are some of the issues we're looking at, um, is the, the off-balance sheet borrowing by local governments. And we made a shift in 2015 that the borrowing from these, these off, the, the financing by these offshore, sorry, sorry the financing by the, the off-balance sheet, financing by local governments um, through these, through the um, financing vehicles, we include that now in our formal debt stock for the general government. So if you look at a time series of our data on China, you will see that general government debt, it, more or less it's not too different, net or gross, jumps from say the 20% range before, uh, until 2014 to 75% in 2015. And then we have it coming down over s since then marginally. But this is an important piece of, in terms of, Important for the for the for among other things that went into including uh, we now include that and, and debt by the China Railroad Corporation. Um, I think I have that name right. Sorry, apologize if I don't. Um, that we now bring in on balance sheet because of various aspects. Um, we actually published an article earlier this week or, or last week on um, the the local government's debt dynamics in China. And we kind of parsed out, given the data that we have, the difference between the official, the published debt statistics for LRGs, so this is just for LRGs, um, versus the, the overall or the underlying debt if we bring in these, these vehicles. Um, and so I just would flag that as an article that came out, you know, lifting the lid on China's local and regional government debt levels. Um, we also provide information on there on a, um, a province by, uh, uh, an LRG by LRG for at least a, a, a subset of them, of the difference between what's official versus um, what is, what is um, actually, that we would, we, would we, we would calculate it. And again, this is when we're looking at LRGs, but on from the sovereign side, we've, we've brought that into the overall balance sheet. So highlighting how we've tried to tackle some of these issues and that we definitely look at, try and look at off balance sheet and, and you know, not just published debt statistics. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for the uh, very uh, candid examples uh, uh, of countries. Uh, it's interesting because in breakout session two this morning, we, uh, we had Mr. Uh, Wang from the uh, Ministry of Budget in China uh, presenting the changes introduced in 2015 uh, dealing with the subnational debt. So uh, it's interesting to see the interaction and how uh, uh, the uh, actions uh, could lead to uh, policy uh, reforms. 
So um, now we have around 15 minutes for uh, questions uh, from the audience. So please uh, ask uh, your question. If you could uh, identify yourself first, it would be very, very appreciated. So please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Jamin Wedderburn from Ministry of Finance in Jamaica. I want to ask um, a question C concerning the the document being, being prepared by the IIF. Right? I'm wondering if it's possible for negotiations to be held with um, I don't know the, the the agencies that have in place confidentiality clauses and um, to encourage them to either amend or remove if possible so as to facilitate specifically reporting requirements of countries to multilateral related agencies. Maybe we can collect one or two additional questions. Okay, so then, Hung, maybe if you want to, to respond to the question. Yes, um, this is, uh, as uh, I said before, this is a crucial but uh, sensitive uh, issue that we really need to uh, discuss directly with you and uh, to learn of your view and how you uh, look at it from your perspective. Um, the contact is that we will um, um, uh, consult with uh, borrowing countries bilaterally and then depending on the, um, the uh, majority of the feedback that we receive, we will work with the Loan Market Association, which really um, prepared the template uh, documentation for sovereign loan. Uh, we have had many discussions with them, and depending on our uh, consultation with you, uh, they will be prepared to look at the current uh, template, which has a very clear uh, confidentiality clause in, in the loan document, either to um, uh, make clear provision for the borrowing country to waive it or to change the template so that it's no longer there so that both sides can feel free to disclose information about the transaction. Okay. Thanks. Any other uh, question? If, if not, uh, then I will ask a, a question for Lisa. Um, you mentioned the uh, fiscal assessment uh, that you are uh, doing at SNPs. Uh, how much do you use the uh, debt sustainability assessment framework uh, of the IMF and World Bank in your uh, analysis? Thanks. You, we'll definitely look at um, the, the assessments that are done. I think um, w that's where I think we, we don't, going back to kind of the message, we don't just look at official data per se. We, we will look at outside sources uh, because we want to make sure that we're capturing the, the broad picture and, and different, uh, you know, potentially different estimates, et cetera. Um, when we look at that, the sustainability analysis, or so in terms of the fiscal debt sustainability analysis, if I recall, they don't, th that analysis doesn't bring in the external sector. It is, it's very much, made, it, it kind of, it's the heat map with aspects of the, the debt, the, the debt component, aspects of the debt, et cetera. I'd have to refresh my memory by re-looking at it. But one of the things that stands out is for us, even if we're looking at, we, we, it, we're getting at, again, our view of debt sustainability, but we also see the external sector and the overall, the, these, five, these four pillars, or the other four pillars as key in informing one, whatever debt to GDP ratio you have, it depends on all the other pieces as well. So it's not just looking at all of the fiscal, comp, you know, the, the composition on the fiscal side. So that fiscal assessment is, is it's one of the five components. I think that's the point I'd want to highlight, that it's how a certain debt to GDP ratio, how can it be supported by the institutional framework? The 80% debt to GDP in the U.S. by our calculations is a very different story than an 80% for Ecuador. Okay, you can have you know 20% in Ecuador and you still had the rating in the B range. 
now it's gone up to 50, 55, and it's still in the B range. But so that's why our approach is different in that it looks at all the, 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 the framework brings in the institutional setting, the composition of the debt, the t tapping of local markets in the U.S., the fact that it's the reserve currency uh, you know, globally, that makes a difference when we're looking at its external assessment and the overall picture. Um, so it really, we look at all of those five pieces together. Um, and how that plays in. And I, and I don't think that the debt sustainability analysis with the, the heat map piece doesn't necessarily do that. Um, so that we, we look at it, but we, we'll look at it as, as, as a key information um, or when you, they do their external sustainability analysis, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so that, and we may try and model things differently and, and, and separately, but the, but the formally, the criteria, the methodology we look at is based off of all five. Um, Two other points I realized I wanted to just make sure that I, that I think I skipped. With the China piece, once we moved the, uh, the LRG p uh, debt, for example, on the balance sheet, so to speak, we took it out of our contingent liability assessment. So, there, so it was one shift to the other, so to put, make that clear. Uh, on the Ecuador side, one of the missing pieces that was when we were talking with the expert, some of the experts on this debt um, committee was the lack of transparency about what was done with the bilateral contracts with Thailand and China, for example, and the oil, the forward oil sales, and, and the challenges of actually accessing that information. So even that goes back to, you know, again, it's the, cent it's the composition and who the borrowers, who, who the lenders are and, and how that has evolved. Thank you very much. I, if I may, I just want to get back to the uh, <coughs> debt sustainability assessment by the fund and the bank and the assessment that a country uh, has exceeded the uh, sustainability limit. Basically, the context is, is really um, very uh, focused and very narrowly applied. It is applicable only for countries receiving concessional loans from international financial institutions or, 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 or bilateral government uh, lenders, uh, particularly those uh, having an IMF uh, program. For those countries, if uh, the assessment by the fund and the bank uh, that they exceed the debt sustainability limit, if they go ahead and borrow from commercial sources, then the concessional loan will, the disbursement on the concessional loan will be withhold, withheld. Uh, it's just a mechanism to enforce discipline. And I think that is the right approach uh, because it is really the international uh, community of sovereign country dealing with one of the member of the sovereign uh, family of nations in terms of mutual help and, and, and have some kind of discipline among government, among sovereigns. Uh, the, challenge there is for, for the, uh, the international financial community to enforce and to implement uh, the rule because more often than not uh, the rule uh, is not being implemented in full. Uh, and therefore, number one, number two, um, there should be more transparency even there because if the IMF and the, the World Bank release information about this kind of situation where they say this country uh, has uh, their concession loan withheld because they incur a private sector commercial loan beyond uh, the, the sustainability limit, then that itself will be very useful information to everyone in the marketplace, including uh, lenders, um, banks, non-bank lenders, and rating agencies. Those are information that ought to be in the public domain, which um, not always has been the case up until now. So I think that, that, that that's how we should view the bank and the fund and their sustainability uh, framework. I thought of something else to highlight. For us, that we don't have a hard number on what is sustainable debt, right? That's where our ratings are, are a continuum. It's it's a broad it's a, it's a spectrum from the AAA to the to the de to the to the default, and so it's and again uh, I think that's an important point to highlight. So we're highlighting kind of the relativity along this scale, so to speak, and where we see um, ability and willingness to pay debt back. Yes, please. So, question for Lisa uh, Ed Bartholomew, George Washington University. Um, question for Lisa. When you're looking at the disclosure, if, if you sus are looking at a country where the disclosure seems poor, do you assume that there is undisclosed debt and do you attempt to estimate it or how do you, how do you take account of that? 
I don't want to say we, we assume there's undisclosed debt, right? Because uh, that wouldn't be, you, we, you don't want to you know, penalize for what you don't know. But I'll give you the example. From years ago, I, I've covered Brazil at S&P for um, a long time, uh, on and off. We have rotation requirements, so I'm, I'm on it again, but I have to rotate off. But in the prior period when I did it, in, in, in the, the Fen and Hiki Cardozo years, you, all, you talked about skeletons, and you talked about what might appear kind of a thing. And so we had an ongoing dialogue with Tesoro in terms of trying to get a feel at, you know, well, what might be coming down, down the pike? What might need to go into the, the, the state-owned banks, right? Um, and so even though certain things weren't actually published, we, with knowledge, with informed, you know, with, with information, we would make estimates. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we would penalize for not knowing, and you know, uh, we we try to make. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, under the the Fernando uh, Cardoso's government, they put in support for Banco do Brasil and and and, and Caixa, etc. So we were, we were handicapping that in our assessments in a different way because there's been nuances on the margin of how we calculate contingent liabilities. So we don't do it in a vacuum, right? We, so, um, and I think that's where I'm trying to think of, you know, I indicated in the institutional assessment, um, is that a way if we feel there's just really poor quality of data? I, I can't think of an example where, the, off the top of my head, where we have applied that, you know, just, you know, quickly. Um, but, you know, we, we will introduce it on for the national income account side, where we, you know, where, where we know there are data inconsistencies and it's something where we know that someone has been tr slow or, I don't um, has not made progress in working with the fund or the bank on trying to improve statistical data collection. So it's with, it, we're not going to do it because we just don't know, and that's an important thing. Well, we think it could be no. We want we need to have some. Um, we want to have some parameters to work with, some some quantifiable. Hi, it's it's Sonia Gibbs at the IIF. This is a uh, question I think for for Andy really. Um, you mentioned the D twenty operational guidelines um, since inception. How would you assess sort of the reception, the take up progress, and, and where do you see, how do you see those, those faring going forward? Yeah, so uh, the operational guidelines, if anyone doesn't have them, they're right here. I can share them with you. Uh, so they were approved by uh, the G20 last year. Uh, we're now uh, in the process of trying to get G20 members to do uh, self-assessments against the uh, guidelines to demonstrate uh, where we comply and where we don't, where we need to do work. Uh, not all G20 countries have agreed to do those, uh, but we're um, hoping to launch that soon, and I expect that would not take too long. So hopefully by the time you're coming to completion on your, your guidelines early next year, we'll be able to have some self-assessments on, on where the G20 countries are in terms of our own compliance with this, this framework. Uh, Andy, if I may ask a follow-up question. Uh, in the G20 operational guidelines, there's clearly um, uh, calls for more disclosure and transparency. And what is not clear in my mind is that disclosure to whom? Is that disclosure to fellow G20 members or disclosure within the Paris Club members or public disclosure for everyone, you know, stakeholders in the financial system to be, to be um, using? Yeah, I think from our perspective, uh, much of this should be public and as much as possible to be publicly disclosed. Um, there may be some nuance in terms of maybe just the Paris Club in certain in instances, but as much public as possible. <laughs> Let me go. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Lisa, you mentioned the five key areas. Um, are they weighted? Um, are they equally weighted? Good, good question. Um, so implicitly, and this is where we, we put our, our criteria out there, so you know how we're getting at our ratings. You may disagree with it, okay? Um, but you, you should know how we're piecing it together. So. In essence, the, our institutional assessment and the economic assessment will account for half the rating. The two of those 
um, are combined to come up with our institutional and um, economic profile. Then the flexibility and performance profile is, is formed by the average of all of those other three. So you can see here the fiscal, in essence, has less of a weight at the end of the day, that, that piece of it. And then we split fiscal into the flow side and to the stock side. So you have the fixed, what you have, the, you, you have the, the weighting comes from the averages of both of those to get to your indicative rating level. So that has been a change. I think after 2011, 2014, I think it was 2011, we came up with this. We've always had those five areas. We didn't disclose before that. There was more implicit weights, Venezuela, right? When Venezuela was in the double B category, much stronger external profile, very low levels of, of, of fiscal debt, but we offset that, comparatively speaking, with our view on the institutional setting, et cetera. There wasn't a fixed weight at that time, but we vote, we, so it was more of a judgment in the voting process. And so here, we laid out more transparency for the market in terms of how we will piece these together, and then there's this m matrix, which I don't have here that's shown, but it's the average of the, the institutional and the economic, that is then off, how do you combine that with the policy profile, so to speak, and they come together. So those are, that's how the weights occur. Yeah, well, hello. So we are ready. We would like you to join us on the reception um, downstairs where the breakfast took place. So we're ready to celebrate the finish of the great day. <laughs>